<laughs> yeah, that's that's the code. I don't I don't want to because we don't not talk about Leo. You know, we don't want anything detrimental happening to them. But yeah, one one from one eight seven. So we are live at FMA discussion, episode one eighty six. And as we said, it was one minus one eight seven. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to this, and uh, it's gonna be me and Martin uh, interviewing. Perhaps I, we can make the argument that you are part of that first generation of social media FMA. You really took a hold because I believe you had that channel since what, 09, I believe? Uh, my YouTube channel, starting yes, my sir. YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, 09. Uh, yeah, and he, here he is with years. us, Sakan Lamb. So go ahead and take the floor, Martin. So do you cop? Have any? Yeah. Cop? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's an honor to finally meet you face to face, man, because like I was saying, I've been following your videos for quite some time now, and I promise myself that next time I go to beautiful Thailand, especially Chiang Mai, I love Chiang Mai, I would go and yeah. train at the gym, you know, for sure. So uh, it's an honor to finally meet you, and uh, I'm really interested because I saw one of your videos where you explained how you discovered uh, Filipino martial arts, why you went, you wanted to dabble into Filipino martial arts. So if you could just uh, begin, begin with uh, telling us what were your first martial arts that you practiced and how, because that's a very interesting story, I think, how you uh, you went into martial arts, uh, Filipino All right. martial arts afterwards. All right, going way back. Uh, okay, so I got to dig deep. Um, really, my mom got me started in the martial arts because uh, I was a scrawny little uh, Asian kid. And, you know, Asians, they, they mature slowly. <laughs> so, like, I'm living in California and, like, all the girls and all the boys are just like shot way ahead of me. So um, I, I had low confidence. So I just stuck to myself playing video games, Nintendo, Super Nintendo at home. And one day my mom was like, you know, get your ass <laughs> to a martial arts class. You know, you got to do something, you know. And uh, she really, really believed that I have potential in it because um, I was a huge fan of the Shaw Brothers movies, um, you know. 36 Chambers of Shaolin, yeah. Challenge of the Masters, all sorts of different things like that. And uh, I think I think she started me with uh, Tang Sudo. We wanted to do Kung Fu, but uh, the Kung Fu school was too far away. So she said, uh, actually, actually wanted me to do Muay Thai uh, with my brothers. And there was a Muay Thai school uh, run run by this uh, European champion. But unfortunately, I was, was too young. Right? Yeah, 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 and you know that was sort of our heritage. But um, I was too young to join the class, so instead they they put me in the the Tang Sudo class. So it was a gym offering different martial arts, and uh, you know I progressed really well. I showed a lot of talent and uh, and ability for it. And actually, um, the teacher Mrs. Wing she actually uh, bumped me up from white belt to purple belt. So she she thought I had a lot of talent. So instead of going to yellow belt, she skip me ahead one I was like oh, that's great unfortunately she put me into sparring class maybe the week after i got my 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 belt promotion and then i just got my ass kicked so hard from the higher belts there's like no mercy you know i didn't i had no clue how to spar and they just wiped the floor with me and i think i think after that i was like I, i'm done with tung sudo but uh, afterwards i did taekwondo Pretty much same thing showed a lot of um a talent and things like that but um the korean master who was running the place man this is really hard dude so he was like he was hitting the kids with like uh the bokin stick uh he he hit me twice he kicked me in the leg like full blast like almost muay thai taekwondo style round kick to the leg i was crying man i was like i had enough of this you know i was like nine ten year old kid you didn't i didn't understand uh the relationship that uh you have here with your instructor at the time you know like i, I was kind of a, a spoiled kid so i didn't really understand that uh that sort of punishment was normal so i just you know i just came home like i'm i'm not going back <laughs> so after that after that then i then uh then my parents found uh, a kung fu school which was pretty cool and i started learning uh northern praying mantis style kung fu uh but the problem was it, it was a distance away. It was far away. And uh, my mom was a bit lazy about taking me. So if I didn't want to go, she'd just be like, ah, that's fine. You don't need to go. You know. <laughs> so I end up going, you know, once a week, maybe twice a month, just not enough. 
And, uh, you know, as you know, you need the mat time, you need, you need the practice to get any good at it. So um, the real turning point for me was when I joined the uh, Shaolin Do, the Shaolin Kung Fu School. Uh, in the east, excuse me, the west coast, they call it Chinese Shaolin Center. On the east coast, they call it Shaolin Do. And, how uh, sorry, how is it uh, similar to what they because I I went to uh, to China to train a bit at the Sh Shaolin Temple there, yeah, Shaolin which is Temple. Like, which, which is more like a circus right now to be honest, Shaolin but, Disneyland. Uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, how how close is it to the art they, they practice there? Uh, it's hard to say. I think a lot of the stuff you see at the Shaolin Temple is wushu. Yeah. So it's like Definitely. really really performance art, really fast and and dynamic. Um, more like gymnastics, I would say. Definitely. So this uh, Shaolin Do was was more traditional. I would, I would, I would believe. <laughs> the techniques were slower and more articulate. They were focused on rooting and power, um, just like the old school stuff. Yeah, more like Unfortunately, a southern, southern Chinese style, like Hong Kong. Style. Yeah, you know, they started you with the the Lohan system, the yeah. 18 Lohans. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and I and it was great. I loved the training. I loved the camaraderie, and I stuck with that for a couple of years. And that was in California. When I moved to Arizona, then I found a, another branch, and that was when I took my training seriously. You know, I was training uh, four or five days a week. I was progressing really fast, and I was assisting, got my second degree black belt in like a matter of four, I think four or five years, and I, re I really enjoyed it, really found my footing, uh, and then the only issue was my first wife, she was sick with, uh, with cancer, and then she had to, we had to go back to, to Thailand to, to get her medical care, so that's when I, I, I quit Shaolin, and when I was in Thailand, I was tutoring English, and I started uh, to tutor my kids in Kung Fu as well, because the parents requested, like, oh, okay, Sakan, you know martial arts, why don't you teach our kids martial arts too? It's like, okay, great. So I started teaching that as well. But while I was doing that, back in America, there was this huge scandal with the Shaolin Do community. Oh, no. And it, yeah, so you can read it all over bullshido.net. So if you don't know, one of my uh, major Shaolin Kung Fu instructors is Jake Mace. So Jake Mace is obviously a, a huge YouTuber. He's not really active anymore, but um, he was my instructor for many years, and he was underneath the, the grandmaster and elder grandmasters, whatnot. And then uh, this whole um, issue came up as the art being fraudulent. There was... Uh, um, sexual abuse cases, sexual assault, it was just a huge mess. So I was glad to be away from it and free, free of it. And reading through this, I was really disillusioned with Kung Fu and almost martial arts in general. So I was just, you know what, you know, I'll, I'll go do some Muay Thai to fill in, the, fill in the gap. And I did it for, you know, as a hobby. You know, I didn't really see myself fighting because terrified of fighting, terrified of, you know, competition. And I was like, nah, you know, I'll be one of those, you know, martial artists who's about peace and, and, <laughs> and self-defense and things like that. Of course, I was kidding myself. I was just, I wasn't taking it seriously. Yeah, because you do, That's, sorry, just a parenthesis, you do compete now, or you did compete a couple of years ago, I think I saw some. Yeah, right? past four years, I've been active in competition. Mm. Yeah. I started when I was, what, 30, 34, 35? Yeah, kind of, <laughs> kind of late to the game. Yeah. But uh, it's been quite an experience. And so uh, learning Muay Thai and I was feeling unfulfilled because Muay Thai is awesome, but you go and train it twice a day and you're done. You know, you, one session is murder. You have to hit the pads for like, I don't know, five rounds, hit the heavy bag for 10 rounds. You got to jump rope for 30 minutes. And it's like your feet and your legs and your arms are killing you. And, you know, I try to do this twice a day and I'm just like, I don't know if I can keep up. And so I was just feeling a bit unfulfilled. 
So I just kind of floating around with the martial arts and then until I took my my students to a field trip in Pattaya. So Pattaya is what we consider like Sin City of Thailand. Um, it's really trashy, <laughs> but we took them there because uh, it's a great experience to meet what we call farang or foreigners. There's a lot of expats uh, and uh, it's a chance for them to speak English. Uh, unfortunately, we, we found ourselves in a dark and seedy area of town and, and, and we were threatened by a couple of thugs with knives. To be honest, I actually, I incited it. <laughs> so I'm partly at fault. Uh, so the story was we were walking down this alleyway and, one, and a car, a truck drives by and clips one of my students. And it wasn't hard, but the side view mirror hit her. And she wasn't being very careful either. So I walked up to the truck and I was just like, hey, you know, please watch where you're going. You know, it's like this, she's just a kid. And the guy in the truck, there's two guys, he's like thuggish Thai guy, you know, probably drunk, you know, really, really tough looking. And he's just like, it's a car. She needs to get out of the way. And I said, come on, man, just like, really, just, just have more care. My associate at the time, no questions asked. Just, he just walks up to the truck, raises his hand, and he just palm strikes the side of your mirror and breaks it, just obliterates it, smashes it. And I'm like looking in horror. I'm like, we're going to die. Like, <laughs> we are so dead. I'm like, oh, my God. The guy's like so filled with rage and anger. And it's like out of a comedy. He's like, he's like in the driver's seat. And he like points to over his shoulder and there's this like, this is Sparta, like short sword. Yeah, I don't know what they call it, Zyphos. <laughs> and it's like, it's in his sheath and it's like serrated and stuff. And he's just like pointing at it. And I'm like, no. And like he grabs it, unbuckles the seatbelt or he probably didn't have his seatbelt on. And he just gets out of the car and he's just raising it in his hand. And he, and he walks over and tries to get to my associate. You know, and of course we've got our our kids that we're tutoring. You know, my girlfriend at the time was now my wife, and my associate's uh, wife who's pregnant and got her like four year old daughter with us. So I'm trying to to deescalate and like trying to stop this guy with you know with this huge sword in his hand, trying to stop him from from uh, attacking my associate and my associate. I think he's got anxiety issues or unresolved trauma. So what he was doing, instead of de-escalating, he was trying to add fuel to the flame. He was like, what, come on, come on, come on. It got so bad, um, my students were just yelling at him, like, teacher Matt, stop, stop, stop. And the guy that was selling Pad Thai, the local vendor, it was like actually like grabbing him with both hands around his arms and like a bear hug to prevent him from uh, causing any more inc incitement. So, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stop this guy from trying to take my associate's head off. In the meanwhile, the passenger comes out of the car, so it's a pretty much a two-on-one, and he's also got one of these swords. Shit. And yeah, exactly. It was like the worst situation ever. You know, I know my associate can't fight. I know he can't fight. Worth a shit. Excuse my language. But um, you know, I've got my hands up, and I, I'm thinking to myself. If I strike, if I show any martial ability, if I show any aggressiveness, those swords are coming out and I'm going to die. And probably he's going to kill my associate and someone else is going to die. And it's going to be in front of these kids or even worse. Who knows? Who knows? They might go on a rampage, right? You might go have bloodlust and, and, and kill out. Yeah, if you take people. out swords, you never know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. So... Um, I don't know. There was a scuffle. The guy tried to teep, push kick, uh, my associate and, you know, I'm getting in between them and it's frustrating to him so much that he decides to, to, to drag me into the fight. So he takes his hand and he puts it on my throat. And at that time, it was like a flash of all the different Shaolin Kung Fu techniques that I had in my head. You know, and, and I recognized in that in that moment that he wasn't squeezing. 
which told me he didn't want to fight me. He actually just wanted to drag me into the violence and then aim his anger and frustration at me. So I can feel his, his anger, I can feel his frustration. And I did what, uh, <laughs> what I thought was the best thing to do. I put my hands up and I said, I just pushed his hand off my neck and I said, please, just go, just go. And off they went. And, you know, they shouted their threats. And I look back at that moment. moment. Yeah, that was the moment, right? That was the moment where I recognized, you know, my Muay Thai would have failed me. My Shaolin Kung Fu would have failed me. The only thing that served me in that time was my awareness and uh, my ability to act calmly. And the, and the fact that I had options. The fact that I had options allowed me not to react in a violent manner. So I'm happy for that. I'm grateful for that. So <laughs> I don't know what would have happened if, if I had thrown a punch or a kick or a knee or, you know, tried to do a disarm or something like that. You know. Yeah. Can, can I just backtrack a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because I was wondering, because uh, you grew up here in Southern California, what was the, um, what was the life event that, made you go back to the land that knock moist and Muay Thai put on like what made you like was there a special thing that yeah, happened? yeah yeah so I had mentioned I had been married previously uh, in Arizona and she is Thai unfortunately she was diagnosed with sarcoma which is a very aggressive cancer so they say like a one million one out of one million cancer patients will get this type of cancer and it's a soft tissue cancer and it, the three doctors in Thailand, no, 10 doctors in Thailand gave her three months to live. Yeah. And she gave me a call while I was in the States. We were actually broken up at the time. And she gave me a call and she said, uh, you know, this is the case. And I told her, you know, you don't need to believe those doctors. You don't need to listen to what they have to say. And I'll tell you what, you know, I think you can, you can survive this and you can you can be happy struggling through it. You know, people live with cancer. I'm not saying you're going to be cured of it, but, you know, you can get through it. And she said, well, you know, they said radiation is not going to help. Chemotherapy is not going to help. I said, that doesn't matter. So I dropped everything that I had, my work, my job, my house, uh, my family, my friends. And I, I went over to Thailand. And I was expecting actually just to see her off to um to see her through the the cancer and then I was expecting her to pass away within the projected time. But um, actually her symptoms improved, her attitude improved. And like next thing you know, it was like six months had passed. And after that, I, was, I had to go back to the States because my parents were worried. I had my responsibilities and my job. So I started going back to that. And then um, she decided to follow me back because she was worried that I wouldn't come back as well. And while, while she was back in the States, she was continuing her education and she got her degree, I was working. And then we decided to get married. And unfortunately her symptoms returned and she, her health started declining. And then we had to go back to Thailand for an emergency surgery. So as soon as we flew back to Thailand, the very next day she got an emergency hip surgery. And uh, yeah, it was a difficult time. Even though she was sick, she was able to create a, a tutor school business with me. And she worked pretty much every day uh, until the, the cancer started taking over. And it spread from uh, her hip to her lungs and then to her brain. And within like three to four months time, she was going in and out of a coma. And unfortunately, I was having to work at the same time. And in the evening, I was uh, looking after her at the hospital. So very traumatic experience for me. And actually, I'm, uh, to be honest, I'm seeking therapy to, to deal with it. I, I just talked with a therapist yesterday to um, just have a talk and a chat because I've had to bottle all these emotions of, from the trauma and the experience of, of the relationship and, and of uh, seeing my, my previous wife go through all that. And it was, it was not long, maybe a year after uh, my previous wife passed away that I, that I remarried. 
you know, and I have a beautiful wife and a beautiful daughter, but this is someone I don't, I don't have a chance to talk to and, and, and express my, my trauma or pain to. So I recognize like, uh, emotionally and, and mentally, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. So uh, therapy has, has been an option for me and I'm, I'm just exploring it right now. So I'm, I'm anyway, glad that that's, that was the turning point for me to come to Thailand. And, and since I spent all these years in Thailand, I was like, this place is way better than, than the States. <laughs> I'd rather be here. Yeah. Glad you had the courage to share that story with you because the three men in this particular interview has been personally touched by that disease. I was the executor of someone's estate before I hit 30. And it was the very same thing. Like um, same thing. Yeah. They're dead, dead, dead in about five months. So, right. Right. But, um, yeah. So, yeah. We feel, we feel you, brother. I mean, I my I'm mom glad. passed away la last year due to cancer. So I know, I know what it is. Yeah. What it, con con concerning that, and I just wanted to expand, like as a as a positive note, would you say that the FMA journey kind of sal helped solve the wounds? That you know that you sustained you know during that time, or how how do you able to integrate that experience? Uh, uh, absolutely, right absolutely. You know, I think the only way for me to have gotten through that is the mental strength and the physical strength you get from the martial arts. Uh, Develop the resiliency and the ability to take punishment. You know, uh, and then it was unfortunate that my my wife that passed away. She she was. She was suffering through this cancer, but she was also abusive. Did he cut off? Uh, it looks like it. Damn. Man, it was getting, it was, this is awesome. This episode is like, yeah, it's just deep. so unfortunate. Very deep, very deep. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go get water and let you message him. I'm gonna yeah. give you water while we're waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, I got, yeah. I got I I got the water. Sorry, so back on stream. Maybe it's uh, his internet because he didn't see the messages. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. Uh, third world there. problems. It's raining here, so you know sometimes the, the <laughs> no internet problem. can get it dodgy. Was, it, it, we're we're getting deep over here, so I'm we're sorry getting we deep. Got, yeah. Yeah. So where was I? Where did I get cut off? No, because I I asked like how did, were you able to integrate, and then it cut off. At like unfortunately, my wife was also, and then it cut off. Okay, so unfortunately, my wife, uh, my previous wife, was abusive, uh, sometimes physically, but mostly verbally abusive to me. So I was kind of going through the double whammy of uh, going through a traumatic relationship at the same time seeing uh, my loved one whittle away and 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 uh, die from this terrible disease. But uh, I attribute again my martial arts training uh, to pretty much saving my life and preventing me from going into a downward spiral, degenerating into any addiction or alcoholism, especially after she passed. And yeah, martial arts was just my outlet. It was my ability to focus on something positive and to develop myself. And um, yeah, when, you know, fast forward, then talking about that story, uh, being threatened with knives and patea afterwards i was just like i gotta find something legit <laughs> because shaolin kung fu would have got me killed muay thai would have got me killed what is that gonna do against a guy with a sword 
so I just took it upon myself to do some self-study. And at that time, YouTube was, was growing and growing. And I came across a video by Doc Alexander Tiongson, RRK, Rapido Realismo Kali. And it was just one of the most badass knife drills I've seen ever. And still to this day, I'm still impressed by that. And I was like, well, I got to learn that. Whatever it is, I got to learn that. Because I, I, I took a look at there's the Israeli style, there was the Filipino style, and I was like, I think Filipino style, way, from, way to go. And so the time I was just watching YouTube video after YouTube video, stumbling across Guru Dan and Asano's tutorials, which it has to be like the worst uh, set of tutorials to try to learn from as a beginner. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, let's do that in slow motion again. <laughs> like, Slow motion is me like going to the settings button and then, you know, playing it back at a quarter speed. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was really inspired though, which was, I think, the gift that Guru Dan has. And I was taking in so much content, I realized that I was just being a consumer and I felt like I, I deserved to have, that I had to give back. I had to give back to the community in some way. So probably because of your tutoring experience and background. Yeah, yeah. You know, I felt like one way communication, it just isn't right. So I decided to make some YouTube videos of my own, just really as a documentation of, of my journey. And I was like, okay, I'll, you know, I'm going to teach the eight angles of attack. And I look back and it was so bad. My technique was so bad and, and the video was so bad. And I, what I would do was I didn't understand editing. So I would just do this eight to 12 minute long take. And if I didn't like it or I'd mess up, I'd be like, okay, let's, let's redo it all over again. And so I end up taking, doing like 10, 20, 30 takes. So I end up developing this skill of uh, going, doing these long takes without editing. Yeah, that's the reason why I don't post that many video of me because I'm kind of a perfectionist and I don't know anything about editing either. So oh, when I evil. film myself, which is really good because you see your mistakes, but it's never good enough. So I, after 10 takes, I'm like discouraged, you know? Uh, <laughs> so but yeah, know you know, and the, good, the thing about video, videoing yourself is that you become very self-aware and it's really you know, good you for start practice. to understand yourself and yeah so it was really good for me to develop my identity or my character um as you see today so i was making these videos and i you know even though they were really bad i was getting positive feedback from people in uh, the youtube community which was great you know people were like keep it up man or oh, thanks for the tutorial and it was really inspiring so there's actually this guy vampire he would send me messages and he said, you have a lot of talent, you have a lot of ability, just keep it up. And I think the, the first video that of mine that went viral was probably like a technique on Muay Thai shadow kicks. Was, they call it the Brazilian kick or the question mark kick. And I was like, oh, I'll, just, I'll just do my own tutorial on this because I learned it from a local Muay Thai gym. And you know, and then it hit like 17,000 views for a first time. And I was like, whoa, you know, that's, that's pretty big numbers. And since then, I, I kept going. And the first time I got introduced to my teacher was when I decided to move to Chiang Mai. So at the time, I, I remarried and I moved to my wife's hometown in Surin, which is the hometown of Bua Kao, uh, the Muay Thai legend. And Bua Kao Banchamek. Banchamek, yeah. Bua Kao Banchamek. Back in the day. Yeah, Bua Kao Banchamek. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I, I wanted to, to live in Chiang Mai because, you know, it's such an awesome place. It's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing place. place. It's an amazing place. So while I was in Surin, I just Googled looking for instructors. The truth was I was actually a huge fan of mixed martial arts because I was watching the Ultimate Fighter series. And I was like, yeah, I got to I got to get into mixed martial arts. you know. But of course, I have no knowledge of gra grappling. So it's like, OK, I got to learn grappling. So I contacted the gym in Chiang Mai, and it turns out there was, it was defunct. There was there was nobody left, and it was an awesome a mixed martial arts gym that boxing, Muay Thai, judo, um, grappling, but there was nobody left. 
the only person left teaching there was um, this guy, Tylus Kwando. And he said, oh, he's a, yeah, I'm still, I'm still teaching grappling at, at the gym. And he was probably like the last one left. Uh, they used to have a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, but he suffered some from bouts of psychosis, so he wow. had to leave. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, well, the contact didn't have a talk with him. What was the name it's of the called, gym? It's um, called Golden Triangle, okay. Golden Triangle Mixed Martial Arts, and it was out of this little this little gym next to this hotel called the Boss Hotel. So did, did, anyway, did, I contacted did, this guy did, did, and, and he told me. Or Paul Pramuk? uh jim ever show up there <laughs> no 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 the, actually they uh book how opened up a gym in Chiang Mai, not too far not too far from here so yeah really <laughs> yeah yeah so he has does have a presence here in Chiang Mai. yeah tony i started learning uh from sifu kwan I, I decided to to take a trip to i decided to move to Chiang Mai. i took over my my parents apartment and they just moved from the states to to Chiang Mai, and um, you know. So they followed you. Yeah, they followed me. I paved the way, and they, and living in the states got too expensive, so they decided to come to Thailand. So anyway, um, are they still there now? Are they still in? Yeah, Thailand? yeah, they're uh, they're they built a resort. Yeah. They're... Here in in Chiang Mai, about 30, 40 minutes away from my house. And it's this beautiful retreat with a coffee shop and a bunch of cabins that you can stay at. This is where we hold most of the martial arts seminars. So we've we've hosted Tuhan Ray Dianaldo here three times. Uh, we've had Mr. Lee Morrison, we've had Guru Paulo Pakaling. So, so it's just the best place. It's the best place to, to do martial arts. And, for sure, Julius. We have to go on a holiday there. <laughs> no, we, we we definitely have to bring your wife too, man. Because the thing is that I used oh, to be yeah. really really addicted to um, scuba diving, and Philippines and Thailand yeah, are yeah. the top top two spots on the planet if you're like a scuba diving addict. So, yeah. um, actually, when you brought up Lee Morrison, that's that I'm gonna tie in. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, I'll go. Because I, I, I want to ask this question because the thing is now your background is like MMA, Muay Thai, Buran, and FMA. But um, when his name get brought up, that's more uh, um, combatives like World War II style. Like that's from kind of like the lineage that he come from, like Defendu, Fairburn Sykes. Yeah, right, can, right, can, right. Can, Jeff can Thompson. You, yeah, can you comment on that? Yeah, you know, being a martial artist, you have to be well versed in many things, and I, it's actually Lee Morrison that presents it the best. He calls it the martial umbrella, and underneath the martial umbrella one spectrum you have the traditional martial arts and the other spectrum you have combatives in between you've got reality based martial arts you've got combat sports and then you have self defense and to me martial arts is is being proficient in, in all of those things it's because you know it, uh, being a martial arts and self defense instructor people always like why don't you just learn muay thai or why don't you just do this why don't you just buy a gun they don't really understand the purpose of learning combatives or learning self-defense. Uh, what is the purpose of combative self-defense, reality-based self-defense is, is to take the quickest route possible, being able to handle yourself in a situation, whether that's de-escalation or um, uh, rapid assault tactics, things like that. Uh, knowing what to do before, during, after a confrontation. So, these are the things that traditional martial arts don't, don't teach. Combat yeah, sports tact, don't, don't, tact, don't teach that. The tactical that. aspect, the situational awareness aspect, right, that's what right. combatives bring. Right, right. But not, not to say that there is an overlap. Of course right? not, yeah. But you have, to, you have to be practical in your approach. And if people want to learn something specific, you, you should offer that to them. So, you know, for us, for my gym, we try to offer uh as much as possible in terms of you know the martial artist or the combat sports enthusiast or the person who's interested in protecting themselves i was i was gonna tell us martin we got to ask um fcs ray Leonardo and then uh abanico stress puntas uh renee Thompson when they're gonna go up there and throw their next uh yeah, absolutely, man. I, I can't wait when this when this the the rona is over 
the we, Rona has got to end. We, 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 we got to go to the, his, uh, his parents' um, retreat center, you know For what I'm saying? Sure. For sure. I'll send you some pictures, man. You'll, you'll, you'll be enthralled. You, you heard that, Alex? You better throw your um, um, a seminar there. Uh, Alex is one of them. Um, my friend is one of the highest ranked dudes in the planet. Dude's probably got a black belt on like nine different FMA systems, trained under Tatang, trained under Montoni, was a uh, GM Ernesto Presas, is one of his longest Whoa. serving Ukes, Whoa. trained under Whoa. Bobby, Bobby Tabimina. Tabimi, like, so, he's, so he, it would be, it would be cool if we could, uh, you know what I'm saying? He throw, he throw a seminar or something like that over there. Absolutely. would love it. Plus the food is the bomb. My mom cooks homemade meals and it's, uh, you know, and we got, nice. we got the cheesecake as well. Cheesecake and coffee. Oof. My man, Tuhan, Ray Di and Aldo, before the seminar in the morning, knocked out three cheesecakes, <laughs> three cheesecakes in one sitting. What a G. Uh, we Filipinos, that's why we're all fat and we got something called diabetes. Because, uh, <laughs> Cause you you attested this, Martin, right? I mean, you have a Filipino wife. Like we just eat a lot. <laughs> we really do. Did she spoil you? <laughs> yeah. The thing the thing I find with Filipino food is when you train, it's the best food you can have because it's greasy. It's a lot of proteins. But if you don't train, you're in danger, man. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I have more more list questions to ask Sakan Lam, but go yeah. ahead, Martin. You got the next three. Well, maybe it's I don't remember. Maybe it's part of your questions, but. I gotta ask. So you started Filipino martial arts learning from YouTube, right? Oh, we got photo bombed again by your kid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Say hello. Hello. Yeah. For sure, it's Same on purpose. Name. Yeah, yeah. Everything's on purpose. She knows what she's doing. Yeah. So, go ahead. So yeah, you you started Filipino martial arts basically learning from YouTube, right? Yeah, Guru YouTube. It's, guru YouTube was your first guru. Yeah. Basically. And right. yeah, so, some people say like you cannot learn from YouTube and all, but if you have already a background in martial arts and you know how Absolutely. to handle yourself already, I mean, back in the days, people were learning from books. Why couldn't you learn from a tutorial or a video, you know? Sacred scrolls, man. Sacred yeah. scrolls. Yeah. So yeah. you're the perfect example that it's possible. Yeah. You know, you know, as long as you have the background and you have exactly. the mat time in yeah. the background, you know how to orient yourself, you know how to move your body. You yeah. can pick up the concepts. Of course, there is no uh, replacement for a teacher or mentor, you know, mm -hmm. face to face training, things like that. But those, those all can be solidified later. And yeah. for me as a martial artist and instructor, the most important thing is enthusiasm, enthusiasm and the willingness to learn and to, to, to stay, to remain a student. So is that, if that's not there, then, then, then nothing's going on. And that's why a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of these traditional martial arts systems have faltered because people are being too strict. The method of learning is has changed. Uh, the media has changed. And the old school guys are still, they're still struggling, right? So they had DVDs and VHSs in their time. And now that we have the ability to to do online learning courses, like we have a whole wealth of knowledge in front of us. Yeah, Again, it's a double-edged sword, you know. We, you, yeah. There's got to be quality control. So a lot of people yeah. are getting away, becoming gurus, or online instructors getting online certifications, you know, without really laying hands or touching hands and going through, you know, the live drilling. So it is a problem. I get it. How did you do your live drilling? My uh, live drilling with yeah. with my instructor. Yeah. So so yeah. You learn from YouTube and then which yeah I learned from YouTube for like I don't know it must have been a year and then like I said when I was in contact with Sifu Kwan, you know I told him I wanted to learn grappling but he's like yeah hey, we're gonna train in the park and I'm like what are we doing in the park. Okay, so I go to the park, and next thing you know, there's Kali sticks everywhere, yeah. there's knives, and I was like, no, you didn't tell me this, <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, okay, so what kind of Kali are we doing? He's like, oh, yeah, this is La Casa in Asano, uh, I'm an instructor under Guru Dan in Asano, I was like, you got to be kidding me, you know, so like, you know, I jump into it, I got my stick in my hand, I'm going through the angles, and then, you know, the, the students I'm training with, they're like, dude, what, this is your first day? And I was like, yeah, 
<laughs> you know, I, you know, I, you know, I told them later, like, yeah, I've been, I've been training via YouTube on my own, but uh, yeah, I, I was able to jump into class and hit the ground running. Nice, nice. And that was in Thailand, right? That was in Chiang Mai. Yeah, okay, Thailand. Yeah, okay. Cool, cool, cool. And then, uh, how did you get to invite those awesome instructors to the? To your place yeah How good question you... so after studying intensively with my instructor for a month he went back to mallorca spain which where where he was based at the time and um before he left he's just like keep up the training like every sunday just run a club you know i was like sure and so for free i just offer him my training to co-workers or to people who are interested and, and just keep up the skills. When Sifu Kwan came back next season, I told him, I was like, hey, I, I want to be your disciple. Like, I, I want to represent you because he had instructors worldwide, um, Great Britain, North Ireland, Spain, the States, but he didn't have Thailand. So in, in essence, he'd have to train one season leave and then build it all up again within three months. And I was like, why would you, why do you need to do that? Let me be your representative here and we'll keep a base for you here. And he's just like, okay, fantastic. He's like, I better show you the rest of the stuff. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, Wing Chun, Shuto, JKD, um, yoga, uh, you name it, you know, Muay Thai, all, all, everything from the Inasano Academy. It even includes yeah. uh, some uh, submission wrestling because of the influence of Eric Paulson and, and those yeah. guys. Yeah, and he was actually a level one uh, Shuto practitioner under Sensei Yori Nakamura. Yeah. He's an absolute G. So, like, everything. And, you know, he, he did his best to, to give me intensive training every, every three months he was here in Chiang Mai. And uh, whatever he gave me, I just I wrote studious notes. And I kept it up with my training partners or who were my students at the time. And in the meantime, I'm making YouTube videos, documenting the training you know, and, and also trying to improve my skills as an instructor. I'm like, okay, here's three techniques that I learned from Shuto or Wing Chun or, or JKD. And at the time I was like, I was really interested in, in Panantukan, which is a you know, really badass system, as you know. And one of the one of the top videos out there was uh, the Mano Nuda video by Guru Gianfranco Lanukara, um, who's based in Belgium. And I sent, I you know, I sent him, a po I posted on his video. Then I sent him a message, and I'm like, if you're ever interested in coming down and training here, you know, please, please, you know, send me a line. And it turns out he had been in Thailand a few years ago, and he's like, okay, next time I'm in Thailand, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And he ended up showing up, coming coming to our gym, and he's like, "Okay, what do you want to learn?" I'm like, "No way!" And <laughs> he was absolutely a gentleman, generous, you know, open-hearted. He's like, "Whatever you want, you know, I'll give it to you." And he taught a seminar on the spot, and he said, "Whatever, whatever your students can afford to pay, yeah, no big deal." And I was just blown away. I was like. There, there are instructors out there that are so kind and generous and willing to come so far. And, you know, he left me with, with a huge impression, especially for my Kali. Um, the way he the way he uh, did Kali, I was really impressed with. And it, it was markedly different from the Inasano, La Casa style, which Sifu Kwan taught me. So I incorporated both systems in, into, into my curriculum. And, you know, after that, I, I was just like, okay, let's, let's see where we can go from here. And we have this uh, we have this benefactor. His name is Charlie. He's like this mythical character. He's like you talk to him, he is like literally like the half Libyan, half British James Bond. Everybody in the industry knows about him, and he knows everybody in the industry. And for some reason, he just loved our organization he loved what i do and he's like i'm i'm willing to help you in any way possible so so he was contacting guys like lee morrison chuhan ray dianaldo um and just inviting them over and he said 
you know, we got we got a place for you to to run a run a seminar. Um, this organization, Corecom Shambai, is this. You can trust him. And the next thing you know, I'm getting the top names in the industry. My God. Seminars. I don't need I don't need to go anywhere. I don't need I've never been to the Philippines. You know, I've never been to Indonesia. Of course, these are dreams of mine. I don't have the I don't have the finances to do it, but you know, it's a dream for me. I, my dream was to turn Chiang Mai into the hub of martial arts. And it's been six years uh, in development, but it's starting to come into fruition. And like I said, it's it's the greatest thing. I don't have to go anywhere. These these legendary masters coming to me. I, I, I just came up with this question right now, not, not that it was sent out to us, but I, I was just wondering because you manifest something that almost like winning the lottery, impossibility for like most people. Do you practice any kind of like meditation or prayer or, you know what I'm saying? Like it can't just be all physical, like you made it happen. There's some must be some type of esoteric thing attached <laughs> to that too. I would hope so, man. Like uh, I consider myself a very spiritual person. I don't, I, I usually, I would say religious at times, but then the religious has a negative connotation. Um, so I, I've been a, a Buddhist, not a super devout Buddhist, but I have my own way of practicing Buddhism. At the same time, I did comparative studies on, on Christianity and Islam when I was in college, and I studied a little more about it uh, the past few years. And I, and, I, and I see them as parallels. I see them as, as working towards the same goal. And actually, I actually respect Judaism and Islam and, and uh, Christianity more because it allows you to live this spiritual life while having a family. Buddhism is like super, super strict. Like ascetic. You yeah, wanna, yeah. yeah, you want to you want to become you want to become enlightened. You got to become a monk. You got to do it now. You know, drop everything. Like, I, I'm nah, actually, I ain't yeah. ready for that. I'm, I'm a practicing Buddhist, and that's part of the reason why I haven't started a family. So, there we go. Right. There yeah. we go. So I, I don't see there's there's a reason why you can't reach, you know, elevated spiritual states with, you know, going the middle route. Or maybe it's more direct becoming a monk. But anyway, like I I just try to be as sincere and as humble as possible. I think the quality about me that people love and like is my humility. And I try to maintain that at all times. And I try to be as transparent as possible. I've got nothing to hide. You know, I, I try, I'm not anything that um, I don't portray myself to be anything but who I am. And I think that shows on my YouTube channel. And I think people respond very positively to that. So they're very kind and, and, and generous with their knowledge and their time. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. And yeah, I wake up every morning and try to salute the sun and, and say my prayers and things like that. I've got a lot to be grateful for. I've got a lot to be happy for. So, I, you know, I think there is the universe working in my favor. You might call me lucky. But yeah, you could say that. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for that, but go ahead, Martin. I ask your next two. Uh, honestly, I'm for my question, that's pretty much it. I'm just amazed by, by you, man, Sakan, because you're the perfect example of someone who has a dream as of, it's full of courage and ju is just moving forward and it's, uh, things are happening for him and the universe is working for you because you're doing what you love and you're passionate about it and it's for me it's it's a uh, it's a big example of success and it's a big inspiration so uh, go ahead with your question julius i'm gonna enjoy the show man <laughs> <laughs> i uh oh yeah your kid photo bombed us again like like <laughs> that, 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 that korean professor that english korean professor <laughs> I'm about um, to give a cheeky smile. Yeah, yeah. Remember that kid that rolled in the room like this, going like this? Yeah, with the bifocals. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I meant to ask concerning that is um, I, outside of, you know, the, you know, the um, being, having gratitude, that kind of thing. Um, do you take any kind of notes? Like, is there, do you do that any kind of planner? Because like in our community, in the FMA community, you kind of is the first generation that um, did the social media and kind of blew up. Like a lot of those videos are viral. You're known as like the lanky guy with the really cool so hilarious Filipino martial arts soundtrack. Where do you get all those those music? Because I'm wondering, like, is he like super organized in the day? Does he have like a journal that he writes like this is what I do from like five o'clock in the morning? Because like those videos, like so many of your videos have gone viral and you're kind of most known as like the how to lanky guy because you would show like moves and instructionals 
and you kind of have a very lanky frame. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then the soundtracks, I know, I know a lot of FMA schools, they use your music. Is it, you see what I mean? See how Mario awesome like this? Know, since, I'm the translator, baby. Yeah, baby. I, since since I've right. been starting Filipino martial arts in 2016, you are my soundtracks. <laughs> yeah. Nice, you, nice. So yeah, so you got you got to answer. That's a two prong um, question. Notes, yeah. So talking about notes, no, I'm I'm too much of a go with the flow kind of guy. You know, whatever whatever flights of fancy I might have, I just I just go with it. So yeah, nowadays I I really have to try to write things down because I'm getting older and my memory's not so good. And it's just a good way to clear mental space because before I would just spend like hours and hours and hours on the techniques I would teach in class. And I would I would watch the tutorial over and over again, and then that's all in my mind. It's like, how do I teach this move? You know, like jujitsu moves, how complicated they are, and you you know, and you don't want to embarrass yourself. Like now, I'm like, nah, I'll just I'll just fill in the blanks. <laughs> you know, I think I have enough technique and ability to communicate. As like, it doesn't have to be perfect. So I'll write stuff down so that I won't have to think about it anymore. I'll just okay now, now it's on paper. Now I can just look at it and remind myself, and that's what I do now. But before, you know, how I got into all all that stuff is, I just, I think I was watching a video, an FCS video um, by Tuhan Rico Cortez, and it was a break in, break out video technique on footwork, and he had played this beat, and it was from this band called Solace, and uh, it's called Belledi, and it, it must have been some. Middle Eastern belly dance music, and it was absolute fire. And I was just like, "Dude, I can I can move to this all day, all day." So, I, um, I found the tracks, I found the band, and I was like, "And every single track I use, I I, I played every day." And every day at the gym, people were like commenting, this, "This track is so good! Like, where where'd you get this music from?" You know, like so I was like, "Okay, you know, I'm just gonna put it on YouTube." And of course, it's it's copywritten stuff. It's not my material. But people are sending me messages like, "Yo, can I use this for my commercial? You know, you mind if I rip this?" And I was like, "I am not the creator. I'm not the owner. <laughs> you gotta ask them for permission. I'm just sharing this stuff online." And uh, yeah, those got a lot of views. I guess, uh, like you said, people are using it uh in their training it's the soundtrack to life for, <laughs> for some of you guys now and then i put number two and number three up you know and i just keep my ear open uh the last two soundtracks that i put up were actually from guru kai uh, kai lewis my uh pang lipur instructor he's also a kali fma instructor as well and he just shared with that shared that with me and i was like yeah we, we got to share this with the world so Anyway, like that's so funny. They call me the lanky guy because I feel like you got to be tall to be lanky. I'm like five foot seven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I may, maybe like the the video makes people appear larger than they are. I guess so. But yeah. that's the comments I get. Like, hey man, you watch that Sakan Lam guy? He got good lines. He's got good like instructional videos online. Because the thing is, you kind of gone viral since like the twenty aughts, and you have like what, like twenty thousand, forty thousand subscribers, somewhere around there. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but the vid, the, some of the some of the videos would have like thousands of views, and then when they train their FMA, like when they're doing their Carenza or they're hitting the tire or the bob or the heavy bag, they put your your music on. Heck, I've I've participated in a sparring session where you were the soundtrack. What? Like, with, with, with it, within like three minute rounds, I, unfortunately we don't have. I didn't shoot a video of that, but we did the Meko sparring, and like you were the soundtrack. Nice. And it's like kind of like a perfect length, and like the yeah. ring, the round we're in, like boop, yeah. like the, the, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I'm just grateful that I've been able to have an effect on this, like on this community. We got to say the Filipino martial arts community has been like so kind and supportive, and you know, I I know myself. I'm I'm beginner, intermediate level as well. There's like really high level dudes out there with vast amounts of knowledge way more knowledge than me and i'm coming here making tutorials on this this generation's old martial arts and they're giving me support they're giving me you know props and things like that which is which is amazing 
And you know, I'm just, I'm just so grateful to be part of it and to have uh, an influence. So uh, it's it's just it's just awesome. It's just awesome. I'm I'm glad you have a very positive experience because you know some sometimes the FMA community will be full of trolls. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, I, I think my instructors protected me from that from that aspect of uh, the politics and the hierarchy and stuff like that. Uh, you know who visited me one time? We we're out of the blue. Guru June R Occidental. No he way. just he actually just messaged me. He tagged me. Yeah. And he said yeah. that you're a golden person. Yeah. So, props to yeah. props and shout outs to Guru June and what his visit had the one of the biggest effects on me because he just showed up and I was like I have no idea who this is you know and I'm trying to impress him you know <laughs> like I didn't know what his what his ability was you know and I'm teaching the class and then like I asked him for a little bit of a demonstration and for him to to share his knowledge and it was just like <laughs> boom and I was like I took a step back I was like whoa dude <laughs> homie homie G calm down yeah anyway like I, I told him i was like please please share your knowledge please teach us and i asked him you know how can we pay you how can we do this and he like he gave me this dirty look like he was gonna punch me in the face he's like don't you ever ask for payment from me again and i was like okay okay <laughs> whatever you say guru whatever you say sir and um at the end of the session, at the end of the first session, he just put his hand on his heart and he's just like, he was so sincere and he said, he said, thank you. And he's like, I'm, I'm so impressed that you're uh, trying to promote the art here in, in, in Thailand and that you're trying to, um, you know, share, spread the knowledge. And like that, that, that hit me the hardest. And I was just like, man, this, this community is unreal. So. It is. It is. If if here's the thing, they they might be the the um, semi occasional, um, not even occasional, but um, seldom like troll, but the vast majority of people actually, particularly the super high practitioners, is golden people like they Buddha, like Guanyin type Bodhisattva type people. Yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I, I was just about to say, in general, in this community, uh, the more advanced practitioners and the highest masters not all of them and because i know some that are not but most of them the highest skills level they have the more genuine and welcoming and compassionate they will be and they will want to help rather than criticize you know so right they got nothing to prove you know they've been through all yeah, of exactly. it exactly everything I, I, they see was, it all i was gonna ask you because I, I believe he's based in rome right um have you did you pick up any kind of short range you know skills from june yeah you know, <laughs> he his, his, walk stuff. his pan and toucan he didn't share the the blint talk he saved that for next time but he shared with me um his uh his uh trade uh combatant combatant skills from his his grandmaster and it was just fire man <laughs> it was absolute it was, it was so good it was so good from from gm earning and, and yeah, yes 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 yeah. yeah. Um, th so this is kind of like a follow up question from like the previous topic that uh, we was talking about was, um, cause you obviously had to go to Thailand for emergency, your first wife, that kind of thing, but what made you fall in love with Thailand? And, and a follow up to that is, are you practicing any Hema or Krabi Krabon and incorporating it with your FMA? Okay. What made me fall in love with Thailand? Uh, I think I was just so disillusioned with the United States. And living in California, I was just really unhappy. I thought I felt the people were like super pretentious and that I wasn't getting anywhere. I felt like it was so competitive for me that I'd, like I wouldn't be able to follow any of my dreams. If like if I did or if I were to follow my dreams, I think people would just like kind of dismiss me. I mean, maybe not laugh at me in front of my face, but just like, oh, you're that's childlike, you know. Like, why don't you get a job, a four hundred one k, you know? Why don't you invest in stock and things like that, you know? Like, uh, to me, it's really petty kind of stuff, you know. And that and that's the general vibe I got from Californians. And I come to Thailand, you know, living. It's it's a really extreme place, Thailand. It's like you got third world on one side, and you got this, 
you know, very progressive economy on the other and, and everything in between. And I never felt freer in my life to express myself and to be who I am. And it, it's something about being born here and it, it, having the connection here and feeling like people were more respectful towards me especially being a teacher in, in America, people don't respect teachers so much as students they don't really care about teachers. It's like kind of ridicule our teachers almost as being a low, yeah. low end, lower end job. And in Asia, a teacher is like revered. It's almost a sacred position. Totally. And, I work in the, in the school here in Canada and I worked as a teacher in China for two years, night and day. It's, it's night and day, right? Com- night and day. Different. Yeah. Right. And this is part of culture and, you know, being treated like that and, and feeling like someone special, you know, it, it it hit home. And the food was awesome. The people were awesome. And I felt like I didn't have to have any pretenses. I didn't need to, to show off or, or to be someone I wasn't. I was just comfortable being me. And that's why I loved Thailand. And the Thai people, they're, they love to have fun and enjoy themselves. They love to smile. Um, it's just, it's just a great attitude. It's just like the Filipinos, you know, the Fili- Filipinos are like, I like ties on, on crack cocaine. <laughs> you know? so like, the ties are a little bit more reserved. Ties are a little bit more reserved, you know? This, so this it's like, okay, this fits so me. True. I'm a little bit, a little bit more chill. Like I can't, I can't operate on that level on 11 all the time. So Thailand, <laughs> is a better place for me. So that's why I fell in love with it. And um, I've been trying to learn uh, the traditional martial arts of Thailand because they have Muay Thai, but a lot of it nowadays is sports Muay Thai. And finding Muay Boran, people people obsess about Muay Boran, but it's really the Westerners that obsess about it because of Ong Bak and, and uh, the movies and stuff like that. But Really, there is actually no separation to most of us Thais, Moi Boran and Moi Thai. Moi Boran is Moi Thai. Moi Thai is Moi Boran. So you have some Moi Thai trainers. If you know you're really close to them, they'll show you the old the old stuff in application to fighting in the ring. Okay. So um, it, nowadays, it's really difficult to go and find like a, a temple school where you're learning the really traditional stuff. It's it's just it's not that prevalent. So again, I wanted to study Grubby Grabong. The only place they were teaching it was in, in PE, PE class and at schools. But it wasn't it wasn't even in it wasn't in the fighting application. It was really just the dance, the Ram Moy. So they would just be dancing and moving with this with the uh, with the sword. I was talking to Julius before that they were teaching at the Putai Sawan Institute in Bangkok, but that that's now defunct and it's splintered off. So it's getting harder and harder to find. So now what I'm trying to do this Sunday, I'm going to learn this style called Jern. And Jern is actually a northern style. It's actually a Moi Boran style from the north. And it doesn't look like Moi Thai at all. It doesn't look like Moi Boran at all. It actually looks like Silat. How do you spell it? Jern, J-E-R-N-G. They call it Muay Jung as well, like Muay Thai, Muay Jung. Uh, the weapons they use, they use uh, double swords, and it looks much more like Kung Fu. You see them spar, it's like half Gabi Gabong, part Kali, it, it, part it Kung looks, Fu. It looks like a giant sword, like a Chinese Dao. Uh, it's more like the Dab, like the, the, the Thai sword. So they'll use, they'll use double versions of that. And the, the empty hand style looks like C-Lot, but they do a lot more of the, the clapping and tapping motions. You know, a, a lot of people misinterpret, misinterpret the, the tapping motions. The tapping motions is actually, uh, um, so if like a weapon is coming in, it's like you're you're like a parry. Yeah. You're not, you're not you're yeah, you're not gonna necessarily get cut by it if it's a single edge sword. If you, if you get the back, basically like you bring it away from you, then you smack them with a the weapon. That's what that is. There we go. There we so go. So people, people like like a punch. Like when people go like this, what that really is is I punch and I and I, I parry your shot. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Self it's, defense it's, purposes could be uh, attachment or sandwiching yeah, it, the strike. It, it's not. Part. It's not slapping your 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 muscle. 
So Guru Paolo Pagaling taught me uh, the other reason for Peck Peck actually as well. Because at first I thought it was only Gunting and I thought it was, oh, like maybe you don't have gear or a partner. It'll be the moment of impact. Right. But uh, Guru Paolo uh, told me that it was actually creates a lever at the at the elbow joint. When you stop the bicep, the elbow and the wrist will go, which will make the strike faster and you'll have uh, a lever point so that your your angle two will be faster. And I like after I learned that, I was like, dude, what? Because yeah. I was kind of upset like the past two or three months, people were going after peck peck. They're like, oh, it's garbage, it's BS, there's no reason to do it. And I'm like, but that's what we do in our in our style um, in De Campo one, two, three. All of the strikes have the, the bicep tapping. Yeah, I don't, what you just said is actually a derogatory, it's a female privates. <laughs> in certain tribes in the Philippines, when you say peck, peck. <laughs> Oop, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. no, it's all good. New it's, trend. It's all good, but but they those those ancient people really thought of everything. Just to one up, yeah. just to one up the people that they were fighting, just to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how so concern, concerning that, as a follow up question, because we were talking about this before the interview, did you also get any kind of exposure to one of the oldest styles of silat, which is practiced in Thailand, silat patani, typically ar around the south? Yeah, you know, uh, I've told you that. Um, see a lot it's, it's very hard to find like all these martial arts are very hard to find is because the Thai people have a very unsophisticated view of martial arts they think of it as just like oh it's violence or sport one of the two they never really take it as uh, art form or way of life a way of personal development so the two prevailing martial arts are Muay Thai and Taekwondo so see lot something like see lot they do have a national team, but it's reserved pretty much for, you know, people who live in the area and, and are willing to, to, to sacrifice their time and, and train it. So, like, I've been to the website before, and it's all in Thai. I'm not completely fluent in Thai. I can only read a little bit. So, you know, for me to go out to contact them is, is, is really a challenge. But um, if I ever do go to Bangkok, there's actually a, a C-Lot instructor who actually fights MMA as well. So it's really impressive. His name is Heem. You can see some of his fights on, on YouTube. But uh, yeah, I'd be definitely willing to learn from him. If there, And then the follow-up uh, for earlier question is if you can live anywhere uh, other place in the world besides, you know, uh, the old Ayutthaya, besides besides Thailand, where would it be? Maybe like where half the year. I live oh. half the year? Um, yeah. I, would, I would probably choose... I went to Kota Kinabalu, Malaysia. That place was awesome. So yeah. if I had to choose, I would, I put, cause it was like, Kota Kinabalu was like Chiang Mai was 10 years ago. Mm. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's, it's up and coming. So it's gonna, it's gonna get popular. And the people there were really friendly. Shout out to Kinabalu fighters and coach Johan, Julian, Lee, Abdullah awesome coach and uh, he really changed my perspective on being a, a martial artist and a businessman as well did you um do you do you know any bahasa melayu like or? no unfortunately not oh, i see yeah, do you have any I, I started to learn a little bit from the malaysian restaurant but uh, it's not enough to get by <laughs> <laughs> i mean you, yeah go ahead i was just about to say if follow up on that question I mean, you're a kind of a real mixed martial artist, meaning you practice different martial arts and you put them together, uh, even though you teach separately each martial arts, I think. It, which style you still didn't learn that you would love to, to learn and teach eventually? A style that I haven't learned that I love to teach? Probably like karate. Karate, oh yeah. Karate, yeah, karate. Any style of karate, you know, nice. Kyokushin, Shotokan, yeah. I'll take it. You know, I think there's this beauty and aesthetic to it and a structure. So Kung Fu is a little bit more fluid. There was structure, but more it was more based on fluidity. And what I liked about the karate was like the hardness of the style and the directness as well. Mm. And there's, there's really a lot of... Um things that you could get golden things especially for the point karate where you're you're blow you're you're exploding in and out 
like absolutely figuring absolutely. out the range i mean th those guys are just like straight you know assassins when they go to like you know oh for sure for sure you know and you know take a look at all the highest levels of mma and ufc we got guys taking a karate stance karate stance plus wrestling you know so well, henry c Cejudo, conor mcgregor gsp uh, has a karate stance yeah gsp so you know it's it's a, it's a different method yeah, yeah. and people will like poo poo on on the um on the point point style fighting but it's the same similar in savat and and uh and jkd the idea is to to hit and not get hit right which is like diametrically opposed to muay thai which is like <laughs> you know eat the kicks all day long <laughs> So it's um, good, you know, good that I practice mixed martial arts because I get to play around with these different styles and, and then apply them or try my best to apply them. In which style did you compete? Was it MMA or I think it was some form of karate, not karate, because you just said you would like to learn. It. Yeah, it is. It was it was full contact karate. OK, yeah, that's so, it. Yeah. Uh, the full contact karate was an open tournament. It's called Zendokai. And that was my first that's full it. contact event. Uh, before that, I, I entered into a no-gi BJJ competition. And then after full contact karate, I did, uh, I did amateur MMA. So you're walking the talk. You're not just uh, learning on YouTube, inviting instructors and teaching. You're also fighting. He's pressure tested. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, was, it was quite the experience. I'm really grateful for it. But it's just it was hard because I'm fighting like teenagers and 20 year olds uh you know i'm like i'm on border of like being middle-aged man now <laughs> 37 38 like the last full contact jujitsu fight i had i was against a, a kid who was literally half my age right yeah please he was don't 16 say that i was yeah 38 at the time and he and i was like he's just a kid he's just a kid that knows taekwondo like taekwondo's weak and he smoked me. He smoked my boots. I was in so much pain. I've never been hit harder in my life. <laughs> OMG. Oh, Don't man. say that. I I, I'm, I'm 38 right now, and I just started the jujitsu. And oh, my God. I, I don't have the. Man. Yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> you got to dig deep for the that, testosterone, that, dude. That, that, don't have that, a kid. If you have a kid, your testosterone will go down. <laughs> that's that's no, my that's my good. base because I, I wrestled in high school nice. and and I, I i picked up grappling very easily but i have such a tough time with um because i picked taekwondo later in life like after college the old one with the the old style of, uh, general che ho he nice. that dude's like a sith where he's one of the few people who defected to the north <laughs> um and and uh, like every, every time you spar with the old style those guys generate so much like psi like the kick of like spinning back is, is 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 as much as Ernie Shaver's punching you, 2,500 PSI. It's unreal. And that, I'm studying Taekwondo now, you know, and, I, and I'm like amazed at the body mechanics that they have. It's, it's the best body mechanics in any kicking system that I've seen. I thought Savat was good, French kickboxing, but Taekwondo is on another level. And I'm so upset that I dismissed it as a kid uh, so early on. I didn't, I didn't think it was effective. And now in my older age, I'm like, man, why did I waste so much time? Yeah, sorry. I'm I'm gonna leave the floor to the um because we're winding down. I'm gonna leave the floor to um, the viewers because I I pretty much asked all I wanted to to ask from you. I kind of ran out of questions. I've been a fan of yours for a good two three years now because that's really. Your channel picked up steam during the last like five years or so. That's and awesome. You're kind of known known now in the community as the soundtrack and lanky guy. And I didn't know I'm you gonna, were only, I'm only stick with that. I'm the lanky guy. I didn't know you were five seven. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be tall to be lanky, homies. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't I don't have any any more questions either. I you you asked some of the questions I wanted to ask. I asked my questions. It's just. I, I, I guess a, a final a final thing um that i was gonna ask there's, there's two things that i used to ask in my old channel was um 
if you um, can train in any FMA system that you haven't, or, or see guys that are like, hmm, that's interesting, like people that are doing something different, um, what would that be? That's one. So that's question one. And then question two is, what cultivated this like warrior or, or, or martial mentality when you were a child? Because most people picked that up playing like cowboys and Indians. When, when was yeah, that seminal yeah. moment, moment for you? So. Uh, so the style that interests me the most, I'm actually training it now is um, De Campo, one, two, three, original. And what impressed me the most was first Guru Paolo Pagaling, uh, the way he approaches the technique and the method is like really a true maestro. And more importantly, like he, he pressure tests and he fights and he spars. And it, his character is so gentlemanly, which is amazing. And I, for me, ought to be honest, the, the style or the method or the technique isn't important. It's actually the character of the instructor. Like, what can I gain from this instructor as a human being? And the, the techniques and the stuff are, are secondary. But what, the reason why I like the compo so much because of the stance and the style. It's so different from the other styles of Kali where like you hold the weapon high or you have it in a chambered position. Um, the combo is flat footed most of the time. You have this really wide, almost like horse stance. And the starting position is a low chamber, a cross yeah. position, low chamber. So it's like kind of like this Musashi kind of kind of duelist style. Yeah. And they make no pretensions, you know, it's like stick only <laughs> or blade, stick and blade only, no knife, no, no, nothing else. You know, their drills are, are very, very simple and to the point. Um, they don't do much flow drills. I don't think they, they only have like one flow drill, I think. Their, their, their drills are combination. I practice Lameco and, and uno dos tres, the De Campo original is one of our base systems along with KI. And that's right. really what I appreciate with the De Campo. They have the inverted Y and it's very basic. Very basic, but it's just reps, reps, reps. Yeah. And within the simplicity, you find so much sophistication and it's improved my, my, my own training uh, immensely. And uh, yeah, I, I recommend people to go to go check it out, uh, decampo123.org, and uh, learn more about uh, Maestro Paolo as well. He's a great, fantastic gentleman. So, uh, and what got me uh, interested in the warrior arts and the warrior spirit? It, it's got to be the Kung Fu flicks, man. Shaw Brothers, um, Thirty Six Chambers of Shaolin, Challenge of the Masters, Drunken Master, Jackie Chan. Uh, Bruce Lee had had a, had, a, had a big influence, but to be honest, I'm not the biggest Bruce Lee fan. Even though I'm a JKD instructor, a JKD practitioner, I'm not the biggest JKD or excuse me, I'm not the biggest Bruce Lee fanboy. Um, the guy that really influenced me the most is probably Jean Claude Van Damme. <laughs> Blood Sport has got to be like my favorite martial arts movie of all time. I could watch that like all day you know, rec recite all the different things in it. You know, it's like the first true mixed martial arts movie. Yeah, in a sense, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and Jean-Claude had this presence that was, and, and, and look, that was just so amazing and capturing, you know, and you know, I just like, dude, I want to be like that. Uh, other than that, other than that, it's uh, video games, yeah. Video game, Street Fighter. Street Fighter had a huge influence on me because growing up, you know, constantly playing and, and me and my friends we used to smoke weed all day, all night and play Capcom versus SNK too. And like it just all we did. And then the the gameplay, it almost became like our method of sparring and <laughs> you know, using fighting concepts. And I idolized the characters or that were in the game. You know, Ken and Ryu, you know, these were like lar larger than life characters. And when I was young, I was like, oh man, Ken is like so stylish and so cool. And the fact that he was this rich guy that, you know, used his wealth to train martial arts and he became a champion. And I loved his brashness and, and, and you know, unpredictable stylishness that they would call.
later in life, then I, then I started to respect Ryu, and then he was more of the you know the disciplined, um, strict martial artist trying to you know perfect himself in many ways. And then I decided I was like, man, I, I gotta be like that. I I can't just sit around and, and not and, and fantasize about these guys. I gotta try to live it. And you know, me getting into fighting and competitions helped me helped me. Uh, blossom into something like that of course you know i'm just an amateur fighter but man fighting is hard it's like one of the hardest things i've ever done and preparing for competitions is it's ruthless getting getting into the cage or before getting into the competition i'm like every time like shaking and nearly peeing my pants and i'm just amazed that i've been able to uh, get into competition and, and face my fears of violence and face my fears of, of being vulnerable out, out on the stage. And I think that's what has separated me from most of my peers, uh, most of the YouTube generation uh, of martial artists, because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the guys, a lot of the peers in my industry, they're, they're more technicians. They haven't tested themselves truly. And I think it's important, but I don't think I'm going to do it professionally or as a career because, man, it's just way too hard. And I'm just getting too old. <laughs> no, but at least you walk the talk, you know? That's what's important. Shout, shout, shout out to people that um, martial artists that are a big fan of the Marvel vs. Capcom. And shout out to Yoko Shimomura. We were yeah. talking about that prior to the, for the, this interview. Absolutely. Talk, 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 talking about you as the soundtrack guy of FMA. <laughs> Shima, Shimamura is probably the greatest like video game composer of all time, because as someone some, as someone that uh, that comes from a music background, you hear the influence of Beethoven, Chopin, and Ravel, particularly Ravel in 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 uh, the Street Fighter soundtrack. I mean, a lot a lot a lot a lot of her riffs, her guitar riffs are straight up rip like, um, for lack of a better word, they're straight plagiarizations. <laughs> she, she would just whole step down like one thing or maybe change the time signature on one. The Ken theme is basically uh, from the Top Gun soundtrack. I think it was uh, Mighty Wings or, or yeah, one, of yeah, the, one of the yeah. Kenny Loggins one. Um, it's brilliant for you, man. I mean, I, would, I look up to that. That's a perfect uh, FMA workout soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> Guile's theme, come on, man. It goes Absolutely. to everything. Absolutely, it goes with everything. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's it. Is there any other topic you want to talk about, Martin, Sakan? I just want to say I'm, I'm really grateful for you guys inviting me onto this uh, this chat, this discussion. And um, I'm really happy to express myself, express my views. Uh, thank you to all my viewers who have given me support through all the years. Thank you guys for watching my channel. And thank you for, you know, labeling me the lanky guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, hope, you know, hopefully in the future I can provide more and more content. And, uh, and I, I, I want to learn more myself. So one of these days I'm look, looking forward to, to visiting and traveling from the Philippines, learning from the motherland. Most importantly, meeting you guys in person. Please, please. You guys have a chance to come to Chiang Mai. Well, we'll have a I want to go, I, I wanna go back to Thailand, that's for sure. And if I go back to Thailand, for sure, I'm going to go visit you, man. That's for sure. Absolutely. 100%. I, I, I got to, if there's a way for me to meet my heroes, uh, Boa Kao, Sanchai, and the guy who drills intestines, Kao Sai Galaxy, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> help, help, help me out. Yeah, I, 100%. 100%. 100%. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for coming yeah. on the show.